Music is a big part of culture, and this includes religious worship. I have previously mentioned bananas of my imaginary river basin, and it might be time to invent some sacred music for them to play. And luckily, I have somebody to help me out. Hey, I'm Nick Kruger. I'm a composer, and I make a lot of different types of music. I've released a bunch of electronic solo albums over the years, and I've also got a metal band called The Chemical Mind, whose first full-length album just came out earlier this year. I'm also a bit of a world-building nerd, and I've always found the diegetic music of fantasy to be a particularly interesting topic. Let us start off with an instrument. Here in Eastern Europe, there's a sort of pan flute, with pipes that don't get assembled together. Instead, several performers take one or more pipes each and perform pieces of music as a group. Life in a monastery is a communal sort of life, so I like the idea of an instrument and a type of music that are communal by default. And having nuns playing flutes feels very fitting. It reminds me of the Japanese tradition of monks who travel around the country playing the flute and begging for alms. Flutes can be made of various different materials, so I will make the pan flute pipes ceramic for extra fanciness. Each nun gets exactly one pipe, which are called fuchta, and each pipe contributes exactly one note to the music being played. Our system for using pitch in Western music theory is based on 12 equal divisions of one octave. That means that there's only 12 notes in this system, which when you play in succession is referred to as the chromatic scale. We can omit some of these notes from the chromatic scale to produce the scales used in most of our music, like the major scale, which only contains seven of the 12 notes. An easy assumption to make is that it's only possible to make music with those 12 notes, but of course we can divide the octave in an infinite number of ways, and those divisions don't always have to be equal. But there are tendencies towards certain types of note intervals. The human ear tends to prefer intervals that come from something that we call the harmonic series. Whenever something makes a sound, a fundamental pitch is generated, as well as a number of overtones. The wavelength of the first overtone is exactly one half of the fundamental, the wavelength of the second is one third, the third is one fourth, the fourth is one fifth, and so on. In theory, this would keep stacking infinitely, and this stack of overtones is what we call the harmonic series. And if we draw musical intervals from the harmonic series, they sound good to us because the harmonic series contains nice, simple mathematical ratios that our ears latch onto quite easily. That's very oversimplified for the sake of explanation. There's a lot of math and music theory that I'm glossing over, but feel free to do some googling to learn more. So here's what I landed on for the nun's musical tuning system. I chose five unequal divisions of the octave, with the intervals between the notes coming straight out of the harmonic series. First we have the tonic, then the just intonated major third, the perfect fifth, the just intonated minor sixth, the harmonic seventh, and the octave. And of course, the nuns of the river basin have their own names for these notes. Setna, Lifsa, Kallade, Tumma, Nize, shortened to Se, Li, Ka, Tu, Ni. The highest note of the scale is equivalent to the first note turned up an octave, so it's the young version of setna, or setna lachna. The nuns also use five notes that are an octave lower in pitch, and those are called old, or hutmi e, which makes for a total of 11 notes, and 11 ceramic tubes. And the way some music traditions don't really concern themselves with harmony and are all about the melody, the nuns of the river basin don't concern themselves with melody and instead focus on rhythm and harmony. The panpipes are the primary focus of the nuns' music. They provide the majority of the harmonic content that so strongly defines the sound. They can be played with sustained legato notes or in a short and rhythmic staccato. But they are not the only instruments used. There's always one or more nuns providing the rhythm by playing on a frame drum called tolle, while playing a reed instrument that fits into their mouth. And there is always a nun playing a large drone pipe tuned to setna, the tonic. Since the panpipes are responsible for the harmonies, it's important that each nun is playing in tune with each other. Depending on how hard one blows into the panpipe, it is possible to play a little bit too sharp or flat. So the nuns reference the note played on the low drone pipe when playing their own instruments to make sure they're playing in tune. A big part of their musical training involves learning all the intervallic relationships between setna and each of the other notes in the scale so that they can perfectly replicate them during a performance. In addition to providing a tuning reference, the drone pipe adds bass frequencies to the ensemble, making the overall performance sound fuller and larger than life. 
The drum drives the rhythmic content of the ensemble. Much like the drone pipe, the nuns reference the drum player's rhythm to make sure they are playing in time with one another. This is especially important when the panpipe players are playing in staccato, as the rhythm can easily become muddled without a consistent tempo. And the reed instrument provides variety in timbre, or sound texture. While the drone pipe and panpipes all have a very smooth and dark sound, the reed is very buzzy and bright. Without the reed, the ensemble might sound a bit too washy and flat. Introducing treble frequencies with the reed serves to produce a fuller overall sound, much like the drum pipe. The name that the nuns have for the harmonies they play is Sasaula Hotlu, or collections of walking notes. And there's a reason behind the name. While they could be playing this music in the monastery, I find it more fun to imagine the nuns playing while walking outdoors, in a line headed by a drummer. And they could be walking through villages and towns, as the Japanese monks do, but I like the idea of the paths they walk being sacred. You have probably heard of the Nazca lines, which don't look very exciting from the ground level, but when looked at from up in the sky, they form massive drawings. And then there's the Uffington White Horse, cut into the hillside in England, and the Blythe geoglyphs in California. The nuns of my imaginary river basin walk paths paved with slabs of rock, which can only be walked by nuns, and that's only when playing the sacred music. Outside of that context, it's a terrible bad luck to step on one of those paths, and if you looked at them from up above, you would see enormous drawings. They are drawn in one continuous line, much like the Nazca lines, so the paths can be walked without stopping, and without walking down any section more than once. And here is some of the music that the nuns play on those paths. Thanks to Nick for composing that, and do go visit his website to check out more of his music.